Let's start with what is one might think is not an economic question, but it is, and that's COVID-19. Because yeah. most economists say we can't get there without getting past COVID-19. That's right. And also, I think we need to adopt the mindset that we've got to find a better way to escape uh, from this, this pandemic, to bring it under control. I'm, I'm afraid that this might turn into a, an exercise where people say, well, the blue states had it right, the red states had it wrong, they've got to behave more like the blue states. Neither of them did that, that well. The blue states um, had a lower death rate, but they've also had slower recoveries of employment back to where we were in, in January. So we need a new measure uh, that's different from what either side w was doing uh, in the last three or four months. And, and I think it's clear what that measure is. Do what the NBA did. Do what Harvard and Cornell and NYU were doing. Test people frequently, isolate them, and then let's get back to business. By the way, do what Taiwan did, as I understand it. Do what South Korea did as well. In fact, we just heard from the president-elect a short time ago where he came in and said, boy, this news about a possible vaccine is really good news, but we're not there yet. It's going to take us some time. So it's pretty basic. we got to test. we got to do contact tracing. Wear a mask, whatever you do. And he said specifically, it doesn't matter who you voted for. Now, that seems pretty simple, but the simple can sometimes be hard because it's not clear people are going to comply with that. Yeah, well, you know, there was an interesting comparison of how New Jersey responded to an outbreak in the Orthodox Jewish community as opposed to how New York responded. New York responded with the more traditional public health measures, mandates, don't group together in big groups, don't do this, don't do that, wear masks. In New Jersey, they just started testing people and gave people the information. And this produced less of a backlash in New Jersey and more compliance, because once people started to see how many of them were infected, they, they took this much more seriously. So as you say, we've got to figure out a way to do both, walk and chew gum, as it were, which is to say, Absolutely. keep the economy as open as we can, at the same time protect people. But beyond that, there are larger issues over the next four years, eight years, 12 years that we need to address with the economy. And we have some people saying, look, in order to really get growth going again, because as you know well, Professor Romer, we've not had really growth rates with the developed countries for some time yeah. the way we did before. We need some yeah. massive thing, something like a Marshall Plan, effectively, to really invest invest in the economy. By the way, we could use the infrastructure and we need to move to green te technology at the same time. No, you're absolutely right. If you look at the, the growth over this entire recovery up until the pandemic, both you know, like the second Obama term and the Trump term, this had the lowest rate of GDP growth of any recovery since uh, the end of World War II. So there is something deeper uh, structural that we have to address. And, you know, this is a time uh, when Borrowing is inexpensive. This is the time to go big on uh, borrow and build. So I hope we can reach a consensus to, on the kinds of things we could borrow and then build uh, to make uh, the, the country better. And Professor Romer, as I say, you received the Nobel Prize for your work in economics. And in part, I understand that was a growth theory that had to do with information and particularly the government investing. We have Arvind Krishna, who's the CEO of IBM, just provided me with a letter that he's written to President Trump, uh, to, to President, I'm sorry, President-elect Biden, saying, look, it, we yeah. need to leverage science technology. We need to close the skills gap. We need to modernize digital infrastructure. It sounds like the sorts of things you talk about. Yeah, although, you know, you know the joke about economists, there's always this other hand. I worry just a little bit that this is going to sound like the scientists saying, we told you so. Like, we told you so, we were right, give us more money, give us more power, and uh, everything will be fine. I think the scientific community, the academic community, has to take ownership of the fact that expertise is not respected in the same way it once was. So we need to figure out what it will take to rebuild the confidence and trust amongst uh, most members of the public. And we're not gonna get there by just brute force or scolding people. Well, when you talk about expertise, it makes me think a bit about the government itself, the federal government itself, because various experts have written saying that under the Trump administration, there has been a de-emphasis, if I can put it that way, on expertise, and that perhaps we don't have the same intellectual firepower, the intellectual capital that we had before within the government. Yeah. Yeah, we, we not only haven't promoted people, we've left positions unfilled, but we've also frozen people. We've paralyzed them so that they're afraid to make decisions. I think of this poor woman whose job it is at the GAO to decide whether there's uh, a consensus that the election is, is over and then triggers the, the, the transition process. This woman is like frozen in place, afraid to make a decision because she's afraid she'll get yelled at if she does what's the obvious thing is to recognize that the, the election is over. And there were people in the FDA, people in the CDC in the same way, 
They were frozen. They wouldn't take leadership. They wouldn't act. They wouldn't take the kind of bold steps we needed to take. So we need an administration that gives people the confidence to rely on their professional expertise and do their jobs. Uh, do we know whether that's something the president can do with his administration without the support of the Congress? Because it looks like right now it's more likely than not that the Senate will have a majority of Republicans. Yeah, I think that the person who's at the very top of the executive branch exerts an enormous influence over all of the decisions made by all of the people under the executive branch. And I think the signal from the top that you will be trusted, you will be respected, even if you disagree with some of your peers or some other uh, policy statement from within this this um, uh, this administration. That that respect, I think, can enable the people all up and down the bureaucracy to to do their jobs. I want to come back to this question of growth because you've spent so much time studying it, understanding it. Uh, there are certain factors that I'm not sure we have a lot of control over, such as demographics. We don't have a growing yep. population the way we did before, which, as I understand it, in history has helped generate uh, some of yep. what the, the growth that we've had. Uh, if we don't have that demographic support, how, what can we ha have instead of that? Yeah. Well, remember, uh, the, kind of the, the size of the population is something we could control. There are millions, hundreds of millions of people around the world who would like to move into the United States and who would be wonderful people to join us as citizens if we could get ourselves together and figure out a way to, to welcome that, them back in the way we did in the past. But if we can't reach that consensus, and we probably can't for a while, there are other things we can do, like better investments in, in educational opportunity. Something bold like what we did with the creating the land-grant universities under the Morrill Act during, 18, during the Civil War in 1862. It was another time of polarization, but yet an administration decided to make this bold initiative, uh, this bold bet on science and education, and it paid off for a century uh, after that. But I wonder if the politics permit that today, because I wonder, Professor Romer, whether you can get the payback in productivity from education within the life cycle of a president, for example, of four or eight years. Is that a longer term, almost generational yeah. move? I, I'm afraid the things that could really change the quality of life for my grandkids when they're working adults um, uh, aren't gonna pay off in a big way in the you know, in the, the life cycle of an administration. So it, it will take some time, I think, to rebuild a consensus in this country that there's some things we do because it's the right thing to do and because we believe in the future of this country and we care about uh, our, uh, our future citizens. But I think we can get back to that, that place. Things are bad right now, but they're not as bad as they were during the Civil War.